Well, I'm going to begin today by saying something that I know has the potential of making me sound like a crabby, curmudgeon-y old person, okay? But I'm still going to say it because I think that a lot of you feel the same way. It's absolutely crazy how much food and drinks cost at professional sporting events, concerts, and theme parks. Okay, I've said it. I'm crabby. Absolutely amazing that a soft drink that costs 99 cents at Quick Trip, if you buy one at the Vikings game, is upwards of $6. Or a beer, one beer, over $10 for one beer. Or how about food? Uh, a lot of the food at these types of places tend to be, I would say, equivalent to you know the standard of fast food. And yet you buy one item and you're lucky if you're paying under $10. And then when you have a family of six, right? Man, I learned this little key phrase or this little you know, life hack is just to tell the kids, hey, on the way home, we'll stop to get some ice cream on the way home. Now that didn't always work, but it's what I usually said. Do I sound old and crabby? A number of years ago, my family and I had a chance to go to Universal Studios in Orlando, and we were actually gifted some tickets uh, because I was doing a ministry thing down there. And these weren't just any tickets. They were tickets that also included the Universal Studios um, dining plan, which means that, I didn't know that these existed until we got them as a gift, that you not only get into Universal Studios, but someone has paid for you to be able to to order any and all the food uh, that you'd like throughout the day. So if you want to eat, before you go on a roller coaster, by the way, a double cheeseburger and extra fries, good luck, but you can do it because it's already been paid for. Or if you want a Caesar salad with grilled chicken, I mean, make it extra grilled chicken. That's fine. It's already been paid for. You want a churro? Dole Whip? Icy? How about Butterbeer from Harry Potter? Yes, 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 and yes. Dad says have as much as you'd like because, yeah, you got it. It's already been paid for. And it is pretty nice as a dad and or a mom who's in charge of the budget to be able to just to say yes to all of these things because they've already been paid for. Now, I know this might sound a little bit weird, But as I was thinking about the dining pass that we received at Universal Studios, it actually made me think about what it's like to be a follower of Christ, to be a Christian. In fact, if you're someone listening online who's not yet a Christian, I think this is the reason why you should consider it. You see, we all have promises that we've regretfully broken. We've all had moments in our lives where we've had a resolution or a desire to change something which we didn't follow through on. Every single one of us have used words that have been hurtful or have been hurtful to relationships. We've all made decisions. We've all done things that have been harmful or not good. And some of us still carry the guilt around from that. And here's the thing about those things. Sometimes we'd like to, well, just call them mistakes. They're not mistakes. A mistake is when you went to work and forgot to close the garage door. The Bible and God rightfully call these things that we do that hurt others, that calls them sins. And our sins that go contradictory to God's holy will, what has also happened is that it has put a gap between us and our relationship with God. That it has put a separation between us and him. There's a debt that needs to be paid. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ came to do. 
See, whether it's, it's sins from the past, whether it's guilt you're feeling in the present, whether it's failures that m- will occur in the future, our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to die on the cross to pay that debt, to give us a relationship with God once again. And so when it comes to those sins, you know what the reality is? It's already been paid for. It's the greatest news of following Christ. It's like God's heavenly dining meal plan. That what Jesus did on the cross paid for all of our failures and sins in an unlimited amount. And we receive all of that by faith. And what's the definition we've been using for faith in this series? It's, it's confidence or trust that God or Jesus is who he says he is and that he'll do what he has promised to do. And here's, here's the cool thing, guys, about our, our failures and our sins that we can never out God's grace. Here's how Paul put it in Romans chapter five. He says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. There's no season of your life There's no moment in your life. There's no moment to come where what we have done or what we could do is too much for God's forgiveness and God's grace. It leads us to our first fill-in for today, that God's grace is always bigger than our sin. God's grace is always bigger than our sin. You can't out-sin God's grace. This message of free forgiveness is what the Bible's all about. It's what's following Jesus is all about. It's the message that this church is all about. And it's absolutely amazing. But do you know what can happen when you get something for free? You can take it for granted. I'm gonna say it this way. We're tempted to abuse a free gift. You know that day we had those free dining passes? I ate way too much. I felt horrible that night. I ate more than I needed to. See, the goal that day wasn't, well, because it's free, I'm going to eat absolutely as much as I possibly can. That shouldn't have been the goal. And in the spiritual realm, because forgiveness is free, we can get ourselves also into the frame of mind sometimes of taking that grift for granted, for abusing that free gift. It kind of goes like this. Um, It's not a big deal that I go to that party or that I have a temper or that I make that relationship decision. It's not a big deal that I sin because it's already been paid for. And it's into that tension of free, limitless grace on the one hand and the reality that there is a way to abuse God's gift of grace that God speaks into this morning as we continue this series called Walk by Faith. See, 2,000 years ago, there was a pastor named Paul. He uh, planted a whole bunch of churches all around the Mediterranean Sea. And one of his greatest letters that he wrote by inspiration from God himself was a letter to Christians in Rome. We know it as Romans. 
And this letter does a masterful job, and it's deep, I'll warn you, but yet it does a masterful job of describing and explaining that when it comes to grace and when it comes to forgiveness, it has nothing to do with us. It has all to do with God through Jesus Christ. And yet even Paul 2,000 years ago knew the tendency of people, of human nature. And so he wanted to address that. And in Romans chapter six, he does just that. After describing free and full grace, after talking about how we can never out sin God's grace, here's what Paul says. So what shall we say then after knowing that grace is limitless and that forgiveness is always, God's forgiveness is always greater than I sin? What shall we say about then, that then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? If every time God gives us his forgiveness, it puts a spotlight on his love and it almost kind of glorifies God for the work of Jesus Christ on the cross when he grants us forgiveness. If, if that happens when we receive forgiveness, well then, why don't we keep on sinning so that God can be glorified more so that there can be more grace given. Here's how Paul answers his own question. By no means. It's a very strong Greek phrase, me genoito. It's translated, are you crazy? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That because grace is free, because you can't out sin God's grace, well, why don't we just do whatever we want? By no means may that never be. May genoito. He continues. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? I want you to think about having a friend, let's say, who has a very serious drug addiction. He or she has overdosed a few times, been this far from dying. You have an intervention for that friend. They decide they'll go to rehab. And through some very hard work, through lots of prayers, through the support of friends and family, they clean themselves up they're no longer addicted to the drugs. They come out of rehab and they say, thank you. Thanks for getting my life back on track. Thank you for helping me, well, have a new life. It's afforded me an opportunity now that my body's healthy to absorb more drugs now. You know what you'd say? Me genoito. That's crazy. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That you've been cleaned up and given a new life just to, just to go back to the old way of living? You see, God gave you a new life through Jesus Christ. He's cleaned you up through Christ's blood by faith. That is the greatest gift we have through faith is forgiveness and a new life. And our number two fill-in says this. So then Jesus gave you a new life so that you can walk in newness of life. Now, this makes logical sense, doesn't it? Paul has been appealing to our logic. You wouldn't get cleaned up only to get dirty again. You wouldn't be given a new life only to go and live in the old life. That makes logical sense. But what I love is that when it comes to faith, that Paul then actually appeals to something that's even more transformational. Look at verse three, he goes on. Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Paul says that there's this amazing thing 
that happens when you get baptized. Now, one thing I recognize when it comes to a a group this large listening is that we all have different stories. Some of you, maybe most of you, your story is that when you were a baby or when you were a toddler, your parents brought you to the baptismal font to be baptized, and that's that's awesome. But I, I know that in a group this large that that's not everyone's story. And one thing I want to point out is this, that even if someone hasn't yet been baptized, it doesn't mean that they're not a Christian or they can't be a Christian. Uh, We looked at last week that faith grows, that faith comes through the gospel and through hearing the message. And yet at the very same time, if, if that's you, someone who follows Jesus, someone who has faith in your heart, but haven't yet be baptized, I'll say this, Christians want to be baptized. Because, because there is tremendous blessing through that baptism. God works in baptism. It says in that verse that you're baptized into his death. And then it continues in verse four. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, here's what happened in your baptism. Just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, when we've been baptized, when we come to faith, we too may live a brand new life. For if we've been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. The greatest blessing that Jesus can give to us through faith is a forgiveness of sins and a home in heaven. And sometimes we we call this in church world um, a great exchange, that there's this, this great exchange where we give God or he takes from us, he carried to the cross our sin, our transgressions. And then there's like this transaction that takes place where instead he gives us to his righteousness. He gives us this, his forgiveness, this robe of righteousness. But, but the truth of the matter is that faith in Jesus is not just transactional. And you won't fully understand faith. You won't fully understand the depths of what it means to walk by faith when you re- when, until you recognize that it's not just transactional, but it's also transformational. Faith is. You see, when you and I put our faith in Christ through the Holy Spirit, he gives you a brand new life, And he also gives you a brand new identity. We become his children and he becomes our father. I'm gonna say it this way in number three. Your new life then is a response to a new identity. Now, let's pause there because I wanna point out some, some differences in the world. Did you know that every other religion in the world has this different. Christianity is unique in all the world. The the, the real view of the real God is different than what these man-made religions have come up with. Because for most religions, the activity or the place of works when it comes to our relationship with God is this. You better clean yourself up. You better do the right things and say the right things and do the right prayers and follow the five pillars if you want any chance of God loving you and calling you his own. And in those realms, God is uh, powerful, and he is, but he's also very aloof and purely judgmental. But in Christianity, God tells us that the truth is that's not the place of works. That God loved you first. He called you his own first through what Jesus did on the cross. And then our life, our faith life is a relationship where we get to respond to what he's already done 
by living a life of thankfulness. You see, faith saves, faith grows. And part of walking by faith is that faith responds. Relationship changes things, doesn't it? It makes me think of a friend that I had in college. We were actually roommates for all four years. And over the course of those four years, he, he really didn't have, he had some girlfriends here and there, but nothing was very serious. Uh, he also happened to be an avid outdoorsman, listened to country music like 24-7. I don't know how we ever stayed roommates, but anyway, that's a different topic, different story. And if you love country music, it's, it's good. And I've, I've come to tolerate it. He wore boots, he wore flannels all the time, he drove a Jeep, he spent hunting season, do what hunters do, going out and hunting. It was no surprise that he didn't have a serious girlfriend. He didn't prioritize it. And then he met a girl that would eventually become his wife. And a year or two after college, we, we got together. Uh, we didn't see each other as much anymore. And it didn't take me long to ask this question to myself. Who is this guy? He wasn't wearing flannels. He was talking differently. He was acting differently. Hunting was still a thing, but as we talked about it, it wasn't as important to him. You know what happened? Relationship happened. And when you're loved by someone, and when you want to love them back because of the love they've shown you, it's going to change your actions. And it doesn't even, in some days in human relationships, you still kind of have to force it a little bit, but usually when you are, when you're in that sweet spot of a loving relationship, it just happens, doesn't it? And that's what it's like with living for Christ. That's what God intends when it comes to our life of faith responding. It's not this forced thing, like you gotta do something you don't wanna do. But what it can be is this relationship thing <laughs> where I get to use my life to not live for myself, but to thank God for what he's done for me. So often here at North Cross, we, we talk about faith. The best way to think about your walk of faith is being just that, a relationship. A relationship you get to have with the creator of the universe because of his son Jesus' death in your place. And then Paul wraps things up, at least for this section, verses six and seven. For we know that our old self, our sinful nature, was crucified with Christ so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Um, do you ever sin? Yeah. Does that happen after you come to faith? Yeah. This side of heaven, we are still gonna struggle with that sinful nature, this side of heaven. But here's the thing. We are no longer slaves to it. Because of the Holy Spirit living in you, we now have the ability and the capacity by God's power to do good things and not just evil things. We are no longer slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. As we close today, there's one more thing that I wanted to point out when it comes to the relationship of faith and the things that we do. And to kind of get you into that, I have just a quick little quiz here. It's super easy, but I am asking you to play along, please. So it's a picture. Is that tree dead or alive? Thank you. Thanks for taking a chance in giving the answer. Yes, it is dead. And you know how I know that? Because... What's going on on the outside is evidence or proof of what's going on on the inside. All right, I got one more for you. I mean, this is a really tough quiz here. Here we go. Here's another one. Dead or alive? 
Thank you. More people are confident now. Okay, yes. It's alive. How do you know? Because what's going on on the outside, green leaves, apples, is proof of what's going on on the inside. This is the very same comparison that Jesus uses when it comes to our faith lives. That one of the ways to know what's going on on the inside is by taking a look at what's going on on the outside. Now, this side of heaven, there's going to be some crab apples thrown in there, okay? It's not going to be perfect fruit. And overall, from you know, the time you become a follower of Christ to the time he calls you home to heaven, I firmly believe that with the Holy Spirit living in our lives, there should be more fruit over time. There should be less crab apples and less dead branches the longer that you know that Jesus is your Savior. But there are fruits that come from being in relationship with Christ. Uh, in Galatians uh, 5, it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, things like love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control, that these are the fruits of faith or the fruits of the Spirit that come when you walk with Christ. And then James, Jesus' half-brother, who wrote a book in the New Testament or a letter, he points this out that I think is important for us to think about. He says, James 1, in the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So the theme for today is not faith can respond or faith might respond The theme for today and what the Bible says, what James says, is faith responds. I love the way that Martin Luther once put it, and actually we're using it for our fourth fill-in for today. Here's another way to think about it. This has been super helpful for me even in talking with other people about why is it that uh, a Christian should care about what they do. One of the reasons is this. You are saved by faith alone, but faith is never alone. It's only by faith and by God's limitless grace, his dining meal plan of forgiveness, limitless, that we are saved through faith. But our faith, true faith, will never be alone. So how do we apply this? Well, I think we all have the tendency, every single one of us, to abuse God's grace. Sometimes that looks like this, uh, not appreciating it enough. Other times, what that looks like is, well, what we talked about before. It's already been paid for, so I'll do whatever. It doesn't matter whether I sin. And I think we all can fall into that tendency. And so for probably every single one of us, in one way or another, today's message about what it looks like to follow Jesus and that faith will respond should lead all of us to do this, to repent of that. To confess that I've been that person that has cheapened God's grace that we have been those people that at times have not taken my life of following Jesus seriously enough. I've kind of abused the relationship that I have with the Father and that I need to do better. But the other thing that we can do in response to all of this is rejoice. Rejoice. You see, there are so many people in this world who live each day filled with anxiety and fear. Not sure how God feels about them. Not sure whether in their minds they've done enough for God to love them. Not sure what the future holds for them. But what we know today is that you can never out God's grace. And that someday when, well, it's becoming clear that your days on this earth are not very long. 
you can have every confidence of knowing that you'll know exactly where you'll be when you close your eyes for that last time. Because it has nothing to do with you. I mean, you got a good job and everything. You're pretty cool. I'm pretty cool, whatever. But eternity, coolness doesn't matter. Salary doesn't matter. What you've accomplished doesn't matter. It's what he's done for you. And that is a reason to rejoice every single day, to live with peace, to have less sleepless nights, to face those mountains that are ahead of us with confidence. Because even the worst thing the world could throw at us is the best thing we could ever have, a home in heaven. The worst thing we could experience, death, is the best thing we could have a window, a doorway to eternity. And so we get to live every day in relationship with a heavenly father who's loved us so much. And as we have been given a new life, let's live in the newness of that life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you that you did not leave any of us in our sin but instead you sent Jesus to cover up, to forgive, to cancel the the debt that we had. And Lord, now today, we just live in confidence and joy knowing that things with you and us are just fine because of him. Lord, we confess that we haven't always walked very closely that there's been moments, there's been times, there's been seasons where we've been deliberately in in conflict with your will for our lives. And for that, Lord, we're sorry. We thank you for your forgiveness. and Just pray that we become inspired today by your word to walk more closely, to bear more fruit in our lives, and to use the time we've been given to live for you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.